Hello and welcome to the Medjlis Podcast, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty's current affairs talk show focusing on Central Asia. I'm Bruce Paneer, host of the Medjlis and author of the Central Asia and Focus newsletter. Religion has been an important part of life in Central Asia for centuries, and it remains so today. However, authorities in the five Central Asian states are using all means at their disposal to control religion in their countries and monitor the activities of various faiths. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF, just released its annual report on the situation with religious freedom. The USERP report recommended the Central Asian states all be designated as either countries of particular concern or as countries the U.S. State Department should add to its special watch list. The report is a good opportunity to take a closer look at the state of religious freedom, or rather lack of religious freedom, in Central Asia. And to discuss all this, I am joined by Molly Bloom, researcher at USERP, who helped compile the information on the cent- for Central Asia in the recent report, and Felix Corley, editor of Forum 18 News Service, an agency monitoring religious freedom in the former Soviet republics in Eastern Europe, uh, and really one of the leading sources of information on what's happening with religion in Central Asia for many years, for for many of us. Uh, So thank you both for being on the show. Molly, I'd like to start with you. Can you walk us through, um, generally, an overview of what was in the report that had to do with the Central Asian states? Uh, what, What are concerns that they seem to pop up again and again in these countries. Definitely. Thanks, Bruce, for having me and for highlighting the monitoring and policy recommendations of the commission. So first, I think I want to I want to give a little bit of an overview as to what USERF is um, and our mandate and provide a little bit of context on our annual report and what we're looking for when we're writing these reports. So USERF is an independent bipartisan U.S. federal government agency and we're created by the 1998 International Religious Freedom Act. And we are tasks, uh, um, tasked under our authorizing legislation to monitor the right to freedom of religion or belief abroad and make policy recommendations to the president, the secretary of state and Congress. And our work is led by nine commissioners who are appointed by either the president or congressional leaders of each political party. And IRFA, or the International Religious Freedom Act, um, mandates us to release an annual report that highlights the worst religious freedom violators abroad. And the report is sort of segmented out um, into two different categories. Um, We highlight countries that we are recommending for the State Department to designate as, as countries of particular concern. So these are countries whose governments engage in or tolerate particularly severe violations of religious freedom. And these violations are uh, egregious, ongoing, and systematic. The second group of countries that we um, consider in this report are countries that we recommend for inclusion on the State Department's special watch list. So these are countries that engage in severe violations of religious freedom. Severe isn't um, defined under IRFA like particularly severe is. And so we at USERF interpret severe to mean two out of three of those previous qualifications that I mentioned. So two out of three of either and they are, the violations either have to be egregious, systematic, ongoing, a combination of two of those three. And so like Bruce mentioned, all um, of the 28 countries that are represented in our re- annual report this year, five are the Central Asian states. We have um, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan that we're recommending once again for designation as countries of particular concern. Um, and then we're recommending Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and for the first time, Kyrgyzstan, um, for the special watch list. And you'll notice throughout our conversation, and I'm sure Felix will, will bring up these trends as well, all of these countries are operating off of similar legislation that restrict religious freedom um, to varying extents and have um, maybe some variation in their, in their uh, provisions restricting religious practices, um, but they restrict the, the, the uh, sort of framework of legislation restricts religious activities for all religious groups um, in each of these countries, but particularly we see the targeting of Muslims as a primary issue, and in particular those Muslims who deviate from the state's preferred interpretation of, of Islam. So I think I'll stop there as a broad overview, and then we can maybe go into specifics about each country as, as questions pop up. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, Felix, so- just pick that up a little bit and with the situation on religious freedom and you know molly just uh, kind of laid out that the state has kind of all, got its fingers all over religion but and yet these in court constitutionally these are secular countries and they're not supposed to have anything to do with religious practices too much what what is this what can you say about 
uh, state efforts to control religion in Central Asia and legislation that helps them control religion in Central Asia? Well, every Central Asian state is very different in terms of the societal makeup, you know, its history, its background, its, you know, the general environment within the country and the, uh, the system. There are many, many common features, and one of them is the government's belief that it should absolutely control everything in the country, everything that happens. So nothing moves without the government wanting to control it. So that includes, you know, the media, trade unions, politics especially, and it includes religion. Religion is or can be a powerful force in societies. It can mobilize people, people get together, and the government is determined to crack down on this, to make sure that there's nothing that's going to emerge from such communities that could cause it a threat. Now, religion has clearly been in history something that, um, you know, in the communist period, they were really scared of, say, the Iranian revolution, um, where Islam more or less took over the state, uh, Shia Islam, and removed the Shah. And this is something they do not want to happen in their backyards. So all the governments have got pretty tight laws which restrict almost all aspects of religion. And as Molly has rightly said, the community that they're really scared of the most is the Muslim community. It's the biggest community. It's the one that they fear could mobilize the population and therefore the controls on it is really controlled from inside as well as from outside. All other communities, the, the regimes control them from outside, whereas Islam, they've created in each of these countries a Muslim board, which is basically subjugated to the state. The state controls the appointment of imams, especially the, the, the top imams, chief mufti in the country, uh, controls what sermons they give. It controls the literature, it controls everything. So, therefore, we, we've seen the same general patterns in each of the countries, the same type of obsessions in the laws. Okay, thank you. Um, Molly, if I'm a very religious person, extremely pious, and, and it's obvious to everyone, what are, what are the authorities going to make out of that, you think? Yeah, um, I think it's important to say generally everyone is, is – there's, there's this culture of surveillance – in all of these Central Asian countries. But I think it's particularly true if you're outwardly pious, if you're a woman and you wear a hijab, if you're a man and you have a beard, if you're anyone and you're going to the mosque um, more often than just, you know, on for, for your typical Friday prayers, um, you can be targeted to more more surveillance. There's been, um, uh, for example, in, in, in Kazakhstan, it's presumed there's a case of Anatoly Zernachenko, who was recently sentenced to prison a couple of years back for downloading religious materials on his phone. Um, and he is somebody who has been known to go to mosque more often, who wore shorts, who, who had these traits of a more, of a more openly pious um, Muslim. And he, uh, you know, uh, he was found a, like, police found a reason to sort of surveil him and then found, you know, the, the materials downloaded religious content on his phone and made that a reason to then put him in prison. Um, and there's instances in, in, in Turkmenistan bringing it back to a, a CPC recommended country um, of women who go to mosque, who wear hijabs, who pray with Islamic prayer beads of, you know, being pulled aside by police to be interrogated, have their phones searched, have their phones, have their homes um, searched. Men who have beards in, in Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan have had them, you know, forcibly shaved by threat of, of, of arrest or imprisonment. Um, and so you really, uh, you know, it's true that there's this, there's this, you know, surveillance for, for all people in these countries, but um, particularly if you're outwardly or openly seem, seem pious and visibly pious, I think that can make the situation, you know, worse for you. Okay, thank you. Um, Felix, you know, Central Asia has been a, everyone always says it's a crossroad of civilizations, and it certainly has been, and that that's true of religions. I mean, there's a, a number of religions that have, have had roots in Central Asia at one time or another. How tolerant is the government of, of you know, really the, all the various faiths? Or is it, it's pretty much confined to uh, Russian Orthodox and, and Hanafi Islam, isn't it? 
Well, that's what the government would like to uh, impose because it believes it can control these communities more easily than other communities that are especially out of their control. Um, so rival Muslims, Shia Muslims in Uzbekistan in particular, but also they've had problems in Kazakhstan. Um, Ahmadi Muslims, they've had problems in um, Kazakhstan and in Kyrgyzstan. Um, we've got the problem with the Ismailis in Badakhshan region of Tajikistan. Uh, the Muslims who, on, who do not want to be subject to state-controlled Muslim boards, and in Kazakhstan as well, ethnic mosques. So you cannot have a mosque that is linked to one ethnicity. So some years ago in the north, in, the, uh, in Petropavl, the authorities forcibly had taken over a Tatar mosque, which, which caters to local ethnic Tatar community. Azeri mosques as well have to be very careful. Chechen mosques and so on. And um, in the south of Kazakhstan, they've particularly been going after Dungan, uh, ethnic Dungans who uh, like to teach the Quran to their children. And there's been a whole string of fines with quite large fines uh, several months average wages for the people who teach uh, the Quran and Arabic to the, the children in homes. So, you know, quite a, a targeted set of, um, uh, of situations there against particular um, Muslim communities. But, I mean, all religious communities are subject to restrictions. So um, some of the Protestant communities, which kind of sprouted in the 1990s, Jehovah's Witnesses, other communities, Baha'is, Hare Krishna devotees, they all have to tread a very fine line. And when they draw the attention of the authorities, then that can be can make their life difficult if they keep themselves to themselves and function, if they manage to get registration, they function in a way that the authorities expect them to do with no surprises they can generally maintain places of worship, but the regimes often do not want new communities of that faith to operate. So, for example, in the Jehovah's Witnesses in Uzbekistan, they've only been allowed one community. They had two registered communities, but some years ago, the community in Fergana was stripped of registration, and they've repeatedly tried to get registration for numerous communities in the country Tajikistan Protestant churches were actually told by state officials, we are not going to register any more Protestant communities. So quite open. In Turkmenistan, there are about 12 or 13 non-Muslim registered religious communities, and there seems almost no chance that the regime will allow any other new ones to register or exist once it exists without registration to gain registration. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the role of, of mo with modern technology, namely the internet and social uh, social networks, uh, and what what that's done. Because it, you know, it, the authorities are always about a step behind the technological advances, uh, certainly with the internet, but they catch on pretty quick, and then they, they start figuring out responses to this. Um, so, uh, Felix, let me go, come back to you with this. Uh, you know, there seems to be a lot more people that are getting detained, jailed for, for what they post on the Internet. Have you noticed this? Definitely. I mean, some years ago in Uzbekistan, there was a spate of jailing people for five years for having religious materials on their phones. And many of the people who were jailed were actually foreign citizens who were in transit through Uzbekistan. That does seem to have faded. Um, but you know, they, they they check people's phones sometimes. You know, it's a standard police measure. They grab someone, they check their phone because you can always find something in it that you can do them for. I'm just running through the uh, administrative punishments last year in Kazakhstan. We managed to find over 200 administrative prosecutions of individuals or religious communities in 2023, and many of those for people who post religious material online or who offer religious literature for sale online. Sometimes there's a website, olx.kz, where people put up, it's like eBay, where people put up old stuff that they want to sell. 
and people who maybe they're not religious at all they've got a bible some of them you know had a bible that they inherited from their grandma one of them was a german language bible from a grandma and the, the person could not speak german and therefore thought well i don't need this anymore i'm going to sell it and for a fairly small amount and then they get a fine of two months average wages for offering religious literature online um, many people post things on social media of contact yeah facebook instagram and so on there are loads and loads of fines for that so it's one of the the biggest sections of the 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 200 people who got fined last year biggest chunk of them and the all of them, as far as we could see, there's some of them we don't know the faith, but they all of them were either Muslims or appear to be Muslims. And especially during the COVID times, religious communities began more and more putting services and prayers up online. So far, St. Kirk is in Kazakhstan the regime hasn't moved against Christians who do, or non-Muslims who do this. But they have done this against Muslims. So it seems that there's some discrimination there. Um, clearly, unless people are inciting violence um, or, to, to, or calling for the violation of other people's human rights, then anyone should be allowed to post whatever they like online. But the, the, there's huge state attention which is given to this. They're spending a lot of resources, the police, the religious affairs officials, state religious affairs officials, they're spending a lot of time on this. And you'd think with the police, don't they have crimes that they should be investigating? Yeah, good point. Thank you. Uh, Molly, I'm going to give you the same question here, too. I mean, I notice this that, you know, in, in some cases, the countries, are, you know, they've kind of encouraged people to come online and discuss some of this stuff. I'm thinking Uzbekistan, but not, not only Uzbekistan, but when people, bloggers, so there's religious bloggers, right? And they seem to be getting into trouble all over Central Asia. Yeah. And I would say Uzbekistan in particular, this is a major issue. People getting in trouble for their online religious expression or activity. Um, we saw just in 2023 alone, quite a few cases. Um, we heard about situations where the Committee on Religious Affairs were, was meddling in the media reporting on Islam. For example, uh, the site KUN.UZ had to cut or change, a, you know, stories that produced it produced on religious matters supposedly due to pressure from the Committee on Religious Affairs. We also heard about another Islamic site um, that's pretty popular in Uzbekistan, or was, it had to shut down, azan.az, that focused a lot on, on Islamic issues, and they, uh, the owner inexplicitly announced its closure without any sort of explanation, and again, this was sort of attributed to, to government pressure. And then we also saw these two young men prosecuted for their online religious activity. Um, a court sentenced uh, Sardor uh, Rahman Kulov to five years in prison on extremism charges for distributing religious songs. He just uploaded a religious song online. There was another similar case of uh, Jahangir Ulug Morodov, um, who was sentenced to three years in prison for posting, again, a, just a religious song to social media. Both um, young men were released uh, a few months later, um, but nonetheless, they were they were you know put through the process of sentencing and being placed in, in prison. And then Bruce, like you mentioned, bloggers as well have been have been fined um, and and placed in administrative arrest for publicly commenting online about about their religious beliefs. There was an odd situation with a blogger who criticized a shop display on social media. Um, and he was he was fined. There was another case where, where somebody criticized that Muslims shouldn't consume um, certain brands of yogurt because they're they're haram. And uh, he was um, sentenced to 15 days of administrative arrest. There was a case of um, an imam who was fined for discussing Islam on social media without state permission. And that's, again, state control over over imams, um, you know, throughout the throughout the country and throughout the region, and having sort of little liberty to have have you know independent religious expression as a as a religious leader, um, and so uh, uh, quite a few cases of online online expression being uh, restricted by by authorities in Uzbekistan, much like um, uh, Felix mentioned. Okay, thank you. And a reminder, we're talking about the situation with religious freedom in Central Asia, and my guests are Felix Corley 
editor of Forum 18 News Service and agency monitoring religious freedom in the former Soviet republics in East Europe, and Ali Bloom, researcher at USERF who helped compile the information on Central Asia for the recent report that USERF just released. Thank you both again for being on the program. Let's talk specifically about countries uh, a little bit. And let's, let's start with the, the bottom of the list, I suppose. Um, and Turkmenistan, Felix, what, you don't hear much about religion in Turkmenistan, you know, just very few reports. What, what's the situation like there? Well, I think many of the religious communities have been so crushed that they're really basically existing at a certain uh, level and can't really develop and expand. Uh, the Muslim community, there, there has been this year quite a lot of people um, attending mosques over Ramadan and uh, at the end of Ramadan, it al there were a lot of people in mosques. So people have not been entirely intimidated. Uh, people still prepared to uh, risk going to mosque and, and showing that they they have faith and want to uh, want to pray, join the community to pray. Uh, but Islam is completely controlled by the regime. And uh, as Molly indicated earlier, in young men in particular, if they've got beards or look to be devoutly uh, Islamic or um, women who wear the headscarf can be hauled in and be threatened. Sometimes men are forced to drink vodka, uh, which clearly is against Islamic uh, belief. Uh, or eat pork. Some of them are forcibly shaved. So, you know, there's all kinds of threats that are issued. And the authorities regularly go around schools warning school children against religious sects, as they call them. And that not only includes people, say, like Jehovah's Witnesses or Protestants, uh, one might imagine, but also uh, small Muslim communities which function outside state control. Um, and earlier this year, ahead of Ramadan there in Ashgabat, they were warning children not to give alms, zakat, the, the obligatory Muslim alms giving uh, to mosques, but to give the money to schools instead. They say, look, you spend most of your time in schools. They need the money. But in recent years, the numbers of Muslims who are allowed to go on the Hajj or the Umrah has increased from Turkmenistan. They, under uh, Niyazov, the former uh, president, but one, in fact, uh, there was only one aeroplane that was allowed to go on the Hajj pilgrimage. So uh, approximately 180 pilgrims, which obviously included, among that number, it included uh, secret police agents. Uh, that has now increased quite considerably, but still there are obstructions. There are There's still the, the government spies who will go with the pilgrims. So, you know, the other thing is because the country is so isolated, it means that uh, religious communities can have very little contact with the outside world. They uh, registered non-Muslim communities generally can only invite one or two visitors each year. So uh, if they're a Protestant community, a pastor from Russia or from another country to come to visit the community, and usually they can only stay for up to five days. The Russian Orthodox Church, the diocese, is still under the bishop from Vladikavkaz in, in southern Russia, and he's still only the temporary administrator of the parishes. They've never had a proper diocese, and some people believe that the government will not allow them to have a, a proper fully-fledged uh, Orthodox diocese in the country. Uh, religious literature is still under control, and if you are allowed to import books, you have to get them. They're taken off you at the airport. They're sent to the religion committee, and they need to be stamped to say they're okay, and they need permission to import literature. Some non-Muslim communities have been allowed to import, say, Bibles or something up to about 20 or 30 copies, but it's such a, a difficult process that many probably don't think it's even worth trying. Okay, uh, thank you. I also want to mention that Turkmenistan is one of only two countries I can think of in Central Asia where the leadership, the leader, is actually mentioned in Friday prayers, um, obviously uh, very glowing terms. Um, Molly, you want, to, you want to add anything about Turkmenistan? 
Yeah, um, I'll just say one thing on on the leader, at least the former president. Uh, there was an instance uh, during Ramadan this year where state employees were urged to to honor the Arkadag, which is the pet name for the former president of Turkmenistan, um, by fasting as he would during Ramadan, which was actually um, sort of contradictory to other restrictions that popped up during that month. But I'll, I'll touch upon, I think, um, Muslim uh, religious prisoners of conscience um, in Turkmenistan, um, because there's there's such little information that comes out of Turkmenistan. But at this point, we know of at least at least 10 individuals, um, but the number is likely to be larger, who are serving at least 12 years in prison for their peaceful religious practices. Um, in quite a few cases, we have, um, for anyone who's interested, we have a database on um, uh, religious prisoners of conscience on our website on usurp.gov. Um, so you can find the individual cases of everyone from um, everyone that we know of who's imprisoned on the basis of their of their religious belief from um, Turkmenistan and all five Central Central Asian states. But in our database, we have at least ten people in um, Turkmenistan who are imprisoned um, for peaceful religious practices like meeting in private to, to study religion or, or discuss religion, things of that nature. And this year, we actually received information about a Turkmen who was uh, deported from, from Russia, Ashire uh, Bakiev, who, um, and Russian authorities worked with Turkmen authorities to get him back to Turkmenistan. Um, and he was sentenced to 23 years in prison um, immediately and immediately arrested upon his return to Turkmenistan for his peaceful religious activities. Um, and we know Bakiev, like many of these religious prisoners of conscience, is being held in um, Ovadan Depi prison, which is notorious for the maltreatment of prisoners. And we've received reports of people there dying from, from starvation and torture. And so um, the situation is is pretty dire. Um, right now, all of the prisoners of conscience that we know of are are Muslim. Um, there used to be a, a pretty sizable group of Jehovah's Witnesses that were imprisoned for their conscientious objection to military service, but they were pardoned um, a couple years back by the by the president. But I think I think Felix really really covered um, the, the the bulk of the situation in in Turkmenistan pretty pretty well. Um, and we're just continuing to see these, these same, these same violations. Um, and like we touched upon Felix and I both during Ramadan this year, we saw an increase in restriction, increased surveillance of, of mosques. There was this ban that was put in place, um, prohibiting those from those who are under 50 years of age from attending mosques. There was reports of beard shavings, of, of searches of quote unquote, extreme believers, and like I said, people were told to fast in order to honor the archidoc. Um, There was also instances of students not being able to enter classrooms until they broke their fast in front of security officers. Um, and so the restrictions really, you know, run the gamut. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, thanks. And I should mention at this point that, that Gurban Guli Berdi Muhammadov, a.k.a. Arkadag, was never really known as a religious person until very recently, and that's only according to state media in Turkmenistan. I'm going to switch over to Tajikistan, and I'll, I'll start with you, Molly. But, you know, th this is one of the countries that's really – it's been striking how much they've cracked down on religion. Uh, you know, I mean – all the governments have done it, but maybe because it was it was a little looser in Tajikistan for a while after the civil war ended in 1997. Now, it's really been a dramatic situation with, with religion just in the last less than 10 years. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I want to specifically call out with the situation in Gornobadakshan, which Felix talked about just a while ago. Can you tell us more about the situation with religion in Tajikistan? And, and also, you know, please mention some words about the Pamiris in the east. Of course. So I think I should start with the legal framework that we're operating under in Tajikistan. Um, we have the religion law, which recognizes the special role of Hanafi Sunni Islam. Like we talked about this sort of different position for for Hanafi Sunni Islam and not even just that school of Islam, but the state's particular interpretation of Hanafi Sunni Islam. And um, any religious organization um, that wants to operate legally within the country must register with the state um, and registration requires providing a lot of personal information, including beliefs on education, family, marriage. And then the state has a lot of broad discretion to reject any applications or later revoke them. 
Um, the state approves all all religious materials that are imported or distributed or sold. Um, and actually mosques have particular registration requirements. They have higher, you know, membership thresholds when it comes to getting enough founders together, um, to register, uh, a mosque, depending on the, on the, on the various, um, category of mosque. You know, religious education abroad is only allowed after studying in Tajikistan and getting approval, um, from the government. And there's a restriction on who can go to mosques specifically. So boys under 18 are not allowed to, and and women in general are, are prohibited from from going to mosques. Um, so that's sort of the the legislative framework that we're that we're working in when we talk about Tajikistan. And so this impacts all religious groups, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Um, I think I'll start with Jehovah's Witnesses, which, which is a group that has been banned in Tajikistan since 2007 and outlawed as an extremist organization, which means they're not allowed to legally operate in Tajikistan. And this year, the Supreme Court actually rejected an appeal to uh, reverse that ban. And it was done in a really murky and secretive way. Um, and um, we we see the continued harassment of Jehovah's Witnesses um, to then find out information about their fellow witnesses um, and, you know, fines and temporary detainments for, you know, altogether peaceful, peaceful religious activity. The government also this year uh, continued to level extremism accusations against those who criticized the Rahman administration. Um, and this particularly targeted um, the religiously based Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan, which has been banned since 2015. And we saw a few cases of transnational repression against folks who are affiliated with the IRPT. So there's a case with Abdullah Shamsidin, Nizomidin Nazridinov, um, who were both sentenced, brought back to Tajikistan and sentenced to prison for engaging online with IRPT content, basically, and having affiliation um, with the group. Um, we also see Tajikistan engage in coercive military conscription tactics um, and using people's religion to encourage folks to, to, to volunteer for the military. We've seen uh, a mosque was closed in Isfara City during Ramadan. And in Badat City, we even saw a mosque destroyed because not enough men volunteered for the military. There's also, um, like we see in, in other countries, this sort of focus on, on independent Muslims being uh, quote-unquote extremists. And in Tajikistan in particular, there's this accusation that, um, you know, uh, that everyone is, is, is Salafi if they're, if they're extremist. And so there was a couple cases this year of folks being imprisoned for their independent religious activity. Um, and these are, these are Muslims. So there's an Imam Muhammadi Muhammarov who was sentenced to eight years in prison on extremism charges for teaching Islam to a group of 12 Muslims. And his students actually faced prison sentences as well, but we don't have any details about um, their names, how long they were put in prison, their official charges or anything like that. There was another case of a different imam, Imam Abdul Hanan um, Uzmanov, excuse me, who was sentenced to six years in prison on charges of participating in a banned extremism organization and obstructing his daughter's education. Actually, authorities found him because um, he had disrupted a wedding and so he was later subjected to an investigation and security services found that uh, from his online activity that he would watch and distribute materials from the quote unquote Salafi movement, which has been banned um, in Tajikistan for a few years um, and is often, like I mentioned before, used as sort of like a, a catch all word for, for all independent Muslims, much like extremism is used to, to broadly apply um, penalties for independent religious activity. Also, uh, to bring it back to Gabal, to Ismaili Shia Muslims, um, in particular this year, we saw, you know, a further crackdown on, on their religious activity. Um, we saw authorities continue to try to curtail the influence of their spiritual leader, the Aga Khan, um, by nationalizing Aga Khan Foundation social service facilities. There's been cases reported of um, security officials harassing and threatening instructors for teaching about um, Ismaili Shia Islam in schools, um, in their typical um, education courses. 
Also, also of note was a January meeting, January 2023 meeting that authorities held with local elders in the region to announce a few new prohibitions on, on activities of Ismaili Shia Muslims. So that was a prohibition to study abroad at the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London. Folks were told to stop hanging portraits of the Aga Khan and actually suggested to instead replace their portraits of the Aga Khan with portraits of uh, President Rahmon. And they were actually, they were told they could no longer hold group prayers in private homes. And this is particularly significant because at this point, there's only one operating prayer house in Gabao, and that's in Korog, the capital of the region. And you can imagine it's it's not easy to get to for everyone in the region. And it's not it's not practical to, to have everyone pray in, in, in that particular prayer house. I also want to note a presidential decree that came out in 2023, which banned funeral rites for those killed in quote unquote anti-terrorist operations. And so you can imagine this particularly impacted families of those who were killed in the protest and the violent government crackdown on protests because they were then now forbidden from, you know, knowing the burial locations of their loved ones or even erecting gravestones. And there's been reports that this has been violently enforced. I know of at least one person who was tortured by local authorities for trying to put her loved one's name on a gravestone. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult situation in, in Tajikistan, and we're really seeing this legal framework and authorities' enforcement of the religion law and other similar laws, um, you know, cracking down on all types of religious activity of all religious groups throughout the country. If I can jump in, I, Molly has given a very good summary of the situation there. It's important to note that when individuals are accused of extremism or Salafism or whatever the uh, regime comes up with, there, is, there are no fair trials, there's no open process, lawyers are intimidated, human rights defenders locally are intimidated, therefore it's often impossible to know how true accusations are, but they just feed a perception that religion is dangerous, that the state needs to control them, needs to watch people, and it's basically tarring people with a a brush that everything they're doing is potentially legal unless it happens to coincide with what the state wishes. Uh, so, you know, there isn't the openness you need. You need open justice if you, you're able to have fair trials and to, to see that justice is being done. And in Tajikistan, you do not have that. So I want to continue with uh, Felix. You've been on the, on the program a couple of times. And as I mentioned at the start of the show, um, you've been covering Central Asia, um, among other countries, for, for many, many years. The, the campaign against the, the Pamiris and the, the followers of the Aga Khan, I, I really do, can't compare this to anything that, that I remember, ever remember seeing before because you can't remove all the symbols of Islam, even though you might not like uh, one sect of, of Islamic group, uh, because the, the basic symbols are the same, the crescent moon, the Quran. But, but they've been able, the Tajik authorities have actually been able to remove most of the images or, or the uh, – the symbols that that are associated with the Aga Khan, right? So this is really practically kind of a, um, a cultural genocide at that point, isn't it? Yes, so clearly the the Aga Khan has a has a very key spiritual role as the religious leader as well as the kind of ethno ethnic leader. And therefore, you know, all the visible portraits, you know, there's one on a mountainside at one point. Um, and, you know, all the uh, you know portraits people had in their homes or in, in centers and so on, they've gradually been stripped away. So it's almost removing all visible signs that the Aga Khan ever had any contact there. He, was, he visited several times in the 90s, or quite a few times in the 90s and early 2000s, but he can't go there now. Uh, people are afraid to have contact with um, Ismaili uh, entities outside the country. It's really cracking down not only on the visible symbols of the religious community, um, but also on expressions of the faith. As, as Molly indicated, you know the the the, the prayers that um, Ismaili Muslims want to hold in in homes. I mean, these are all banned. Um, you know, these are pretty crucial 
elements of the faith and respected leaders have been uh, intimidated into silence. One of them in particular is in jail. Um, so, you know, the, and even as, as Molly said, you know, when, when people are killed in, by the security forces uh, in very disputed circumstances, uh, the fact that people can't even have a respectful burial and a place where people can basically lie in peace and in uh, among their uh, relatives and so on. I mean, burials in Central Asia are very important to the honor and dignity of the families, as well as, you know, the respect for the, the actual um, person who's died. So this is really going after um, something that people are worried about. People want to know that when they die, they'll be buried with respect. Their grave will be treated with respect. They'll be among their own people in the cemetery. And it worries people. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a great discussion, but we are running uh, running short on time, um, so we're going to have to kind of lump Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan together. So I'd like to get your comments on that. Uh, you know, I'd met, we'd met, talked about bloggers in Uzbekistan, um, but of course this situation, it's the same situation in Kazakhstan and even Kyrgyzstan. The, the, the Internet's monitored. Uh, what you say about religion um does the authorities do see it and they will act against you um so uh, i'll start with you molly can you talk about you know which of those three countries that i named do you think that the developments uh with religious freedom are, are most alarming i think i think they're all alarming i think we're seeing in in kazakhstan just sort of a stagnancy in terms of the the status of religious freedom. I mean, it's it's at it's 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 been at a low place for quite a few years, and it's remained at that low place. Um, at Uz in Uzbekistan, where we've seen a lot of great reforms, but in the past year or so, we've seen a backsliding on those reforms. And in Kyrgyzstan, our new recommendation, um, we're seeing religious freedom conditions uh, uh, really deteriorate. And so uh, maybe I'll, Bruce, would you like me to go into Kyrgyzstan a little bit? Um, yeah, please. I also want to get Felix's thoughts on that too, because Kyrgyzstan has is, is always been an outlier, but it's starting to look more like the rest of them. Yeah. So, so Kyrgyzstan is, is, is the Kyrgyz government is increasingly um, enforcing, you know, a long existing set of restrictive legislation regulating religion. Um, and we're seeing peaceful religious practices like online religious expression, collective worship, and the possession of unauthorized religious materials all be penalized. Um, particularly this year, we saw the targeting of, of independent Muslims. And so the country maintains a list of um, extremist organizations um, which contains some groups that USERF knows to not incite violence or, or be violent. And so some of those groups include Hizbat Tahrir and Yakin and Kar. And we see, we've seen multiple instances in the past year or so of members from both groups um, having their homes searched by security forces and then being called into police stations um, where they're, you know, then forced to renounce their beliefs on video or in conversations with officials. Um, and on the other end of things, we've saw this mass interdepartmental inspection of Islamic institutions throughout Kyrgyzstan. Um, buildings were closed um, both temporarily and permanently for violating various safety standards like building codes, health codes, and, and the religion law. And these are Islamic institutions that are independent, that maybe aren't registered with the state and have, have flown under the radar for a while. Um, but I, I see this mass inspection of institutions as sort of proof that the government is paying more attention, attention to religious activity, particularly of Muslims in Kyrgyzstan, and is really making sure that groups are registered and adhering to adhering to the law. And so this was this was a, a major development from the past year. Um, and then the situation is 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 similarly poor for non-Muslim groups. There were raids of a there was a raid of a Catholic church, there was a raid of a Protestant church, and and foreign churchgoers were were fined um, during those raids. There was closure of several Protestant in institutions. Um, for building code violations, a Hare Krishna wedding rehearsal was disrupted, um, and and folks were were had their visas revoked and and were sent back home. Um, a, the host was fined, um, so generally a wide spat of issues 
online activity has actually been penalized with with time in prison. There's a case of Aitbek uh, Tinaliyev, who's a Protestant Christian, who was sentenced to six months um, last year for inciting religious enmity for for making social media posts that criticized official religious policies and and promoted his own his own uh, Christian beliefs. Um, there was another individual, Artsenbek Abdildayev, who was detained for inciting religious enmity. And he authored social media pages that, uh, according to the government, contained calls for religious hatred. Um, and in these posts, he called himself a new god, a savior, criticized other religions. And he later died in prison under murky circumstances. Um, but Abdul Dayev was also uh, pretty well known in Kyrgyzstan, and he was a presidential candidate at one point, and was pretty pretty famous for uh, you know his his actions during the uh, during the uh, campaign. Um, and then on there was three men who posted a video online actually criticizing the closure of their mosque, which was one of the mosques that was impacted by the uh, the mass inspections that I mentioned earlier. Um, and two of those men were were ultimately sentenced to prison. And so Kyrgyzstan is also, you know, cracking down on on online religious expression as well, um, particularly as it pertains to official government official government policies. Okay, thank you, uh, and Felix. I'll, I'll let you handle those three too. And I apologize. I mean, obviously, each country could have its own podcast uh, dedicated to it in the religious freedom situation. But um, your thoughts on on those three countries? Yeah, I mean, staying with Kyrgyzstan, well, perhaps we'll just look at, you know, the, the continuing legal threats of new laws. Um, governments seem to think that because the laws so far haven't stopped people from practicing their faith as they choose, they need to make them even tighter, despite the fact they already ban unregistered religious practice, they impose religious censorship, they allow plenty of scope for religious communities to be banned or closed down if the regime don't like them. Uh, they keep thinking we need to make the laws even tighter. Kyrgyzstan, the state Commission for Religious Affairs prepared draft laws which would uh, sharply increase controls even more. Uh, these have been lurking around for a couple of years and we just don't know when they might hit Parliament. Uh, clearly once if they do reach Parliament then they can uh, you know they can be um, tracked and so on but at the moment while they're in the government corridors we've got no idea when they might emerge. The government put them out for public consultation at one point, a uh, fairly short-run parliamentary, uh, sorry, public consultation late last year, whether they'll actually pay any attention to the uh, comments they got from people, who knows. Kazakhstan, again, we know that they're preparing um, a tighter religion law and the government actually admitted in a presentation to parliamentary deputies, a closed presentation, that in the past the government proposed a tie to religion law and they there were protests from the US State Department, the European Union and so on. Therefore, what they're doing now is to get parliamentary deputies to present a text as though it came from themselves, not from the government, to kind of keep it at arm's length. Now, this draft law we've seen uh, texts which have become public um, but not widely circulated not officially circulated uh, but we just don't know when that will hit parliament as well once it's there you know we'll be able to see it and, and be able to track it but it could arrive tomorrow or not tomorrow but next week or it could never arrive. We just don't know because the uh, parliaments are under complete state control. The state, you know, parliaments are not freely elected and they, they can't unilaterally uh, present uh, new laws. They have to have basically tacit government approval or open government approval. Um, you know, we, we know that the government must be backing such tighter restrictions. So we're just waiting to see, and religious communities are just left feeling very nervous. What's going to come next? In Kyrgyzstan as well, we have the, the new foreign agents law, um, and religious communities are now looking at how it might affect their activity. If they get funding from abroad, they could be caught up in it. And at the moment, ones we've spoken to just don't know 
how it might affect them, but it just leaves everyone nervous the whole time. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll give you both like two minutes uh, to for final thoughts, but about the direction of freedom of religion. Uh, is there uh, is there any bright spots, any, any silver lining, anything we can look forward to, or are we just headed in the wrong direction as far as re- protection of religious freedom? And I'll start with you, Felix. Well, I think the, the regimes are heading in the wrong direction. They want to control uh, the exercise of freedom of religion or belief in an ever tighter way. But the bright spot is that ordinary people continue to choose their faith, practice their faith, share their faith, exercise their faith, want to read religious materials of their choice, and generally try to evade or ignore government restrictions as far as they can. That's a bright spot. It it is. Thank you. Molly? I'd have to agree with Felix. I think each of the governments, each of the governments of all of these countries are just finding new ways all the time to further restrict religious freedom. And then we see that, you know, the citizens of all these countries are, are, are pretty much fearless about their religious practices. Um, they, they are aware that they have the right to freedom of religion or belief, and they fully and freely uh, practice their, their faith, you know, despite the threat of, of government interference. Um, so uh, I, you know, that's all we can. That's all we can hope for in the face of you know intense government crackdowns on religious practices. Okay. Well, thank you. Like I said, we could. This is a, a discussion we could have for for uh, days, actually, on end. Um, but I appreciate you both being on. I'm sure I'm going to have you both back on in the future. Anyone uh, for our audience, if you want to find out more information about uh, the problems with freedom of religion in Central Asia, you can go to the USERF website or Forum 18. Uh, and find out more on this. So, uh, But for now, thank you, Molly, and thank you, Felix. And a big thank you, as always, to Nathan Shoemaker, our Medjolice podcast producer in Washington, D.C. And a reminder, you can subscribe to the Medjolice podcast or the Central Asia and Focus newsletter by visiting Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty's website at rfarl.org. Thanks, and we'll be back soon. Bye-bye.